Okay. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Arvind. I lead a research team at Princeton uh, uh, working on cryptocurrencies. We've uh, done a bunch of cool stuff over the years, like uh, we did an online course and textbook on cryptocurrencies. But what I'd like to tell you about today is the tool that we built for blockchain analytics. But before I say a word about BlockSci, I want to take a minute to try and convince you that blockchain analysis is cool and interesting, and you need to be doing it, whether you're a cryptocurrency developer or you're somebody with crypto assets or you're a student. And I, I want to argue that there is something in it for all of you. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. Let me start with something perhaps whimsical, a little bit tragicomical. Let's look at all of the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain that have paid over $1,000 in transaction fees. So here we see a chart of that, and the x-axis is time. The y-axis is US dollars equivalent in a logarithmic scale. So this is $1,000, this is $10,000, and this is $100,000 over here. And you can see there is a crazy transaction up on top that paid the equivalent of 137,000 US dollars at the time in transaction fees. So what happened there? That's not the only one. There are a few that are really up there. And overall, a whole lot of transactions that have paid an absurd amount of transaction fees. So what happened in this case, this was a well-publicized incident. Somebody had a bug and they accidentally swapped the value in the transaction fee in their, in their transaction. And of course, they lost that money never to get it back. Uh, and so this is a nice example, a nice illustration of the fact that the blockchain still has a lot of sharp corners. You have to be really careful. There are a lot of ways to lose your money uh, accidentally. And this is just one of them. And these are the kinds of, one, one of the kinds of things we can find out through blockchain analysis. And I think this is you know, a good learning experience for a lot of people. But now let's get to something more serious. Let's imagine a typical situation at a company. Let's say you're worried about the security of your crypto assets, and so you're using best practices. You're using a multi-signature wallet, and control over the wallet is distributed between three of the employees in your company. Pretty common situation, but let's say that Carol leaves the company and Dave is hired to replace her. What do you think would happen in the situation? What the company would have to do is to transfer all of the funds in this wallet into a new wallet that is now controlled by Alice, Bob, and Dave. So a set of three private keys that shares two private keys with the uh, first multi-sig wallet, but now has a new key. The crucial point that I want to make here is that this transaction is going to be publicly visible on the blockchain. So any competitor of this company using blockchain analysis would be able to look at this and figure out, oh, something interesting happened at this company. Uh, some sort of rearrangement has happened. Something uh, has been shuffled. This wallet has been transferred to a uh, new access structure and new control structure. So we looked at this using blockchain analysis, and it turns out that on average, there are 20,000 transactions per month that expose confidential information, internal company information, on the public blockchain in this way because of this inevitable property of multisig that whenever you change the set of keys that are associated with a wallet, you have to essentially broadcast it on the blockchain. So this is an example of how you can use uh, blockchain analysis for competitive intelligence. But it gets worse than this. In this example, companies are exposing this private information that they shouldn't be exposing. But it turns out that a lot of entities are also weakening their security through incorrect use of multisig. Let me show you a slight variant of this. What we've also found is that in many cases, companies have this kind of access structure, and they want to move to you know, this Alice, Bob, and Dave situation here. But what they end up doing, instead of a single transaction that transfers from wallet A to wallet B, is they temporarily take it through a traditional just a pay to pub key hash address, losing the benefits of multisig, temporarily transferring all their funds to a single machine, a single point of control, a single point of failure. And if there's malware on that machine, they would, of course, lose all of those funds. Uh, and perhaps they don't realize the security consequences of this. But for whatever reason, we found that this is also a very common pattern on the blockchain. There are over 1,000 transactions per month that are weakening security in this way. So maybe this is happening in your organization. It might be uh, time for a checkup of your security practices. Uh, but in fact, even using public blockchain analysis, you or anybody else could identify that these sorts of security weaknesses are going on. 
So I've tried to give you a few examples, but now let me give you sort of a more comprehensive list of reasons why you might want to do blockchain analysis. You might be, for example, a researcher, and your goal might be to ask, how anonymous is a particular cryptocurrency that I'm interested in? And you want to do that using graph analysis of the transaction graph, and the tool that I'm going to present, BlockSci, is going to be perfect for that. We've used that to analyze the anonymity of Monero, of Dash, and of CoinJoin, and we've shown in some papers that uh, CoinJoin is maybe not quite as private as thought before based on the typical ways in which people use it. You might want to ask, what, what are the typical uses of the cryptocurrency? And you might be able to get that out of blockchain analysis. You might want to monitor the health of the overall system. Are miners following the protocol? You might want to think about security, privacy, and confidentiality. I've given you a couple of examples of this. Uh, you might want to do competitive intelligence. You might want to look at your competitor's cold wallet and use blockchain analysis to figure out how much money is actually in there. These are the types of things that one can definitely do today. We've talked to companies and asked them, are you not worried about this? And they said, oh, we think it's too hard to do. Nobody's going to be doing that. But no, it's actually really easy to do. And it's something you might want to consider doing. Uh, and uh, forensics, analyzing theft and things like that. Uh, but also, finally, as an educational tool. For a lot of students, we've used our tool BlockSci as the basis of tutorials for blockchain technology. And it's a really useful way to get uh, students int uh, introduced to the technology by analyzing data on a large scale because it holds so many interesting and fascinating secrets out in the open. So those are some different uses of this. Uh, and you might wonder, you know, isn't this what uh, Chainalysis does? Chainalysis was mentioned in the previous talk as well. They offer blockchain analysis tools, but but a very different kind of target from uh, what we're thinking about. Chain analysis is targeted towards law enforcement agencies to analyze theft and things like that. And it's aimed at a somewhat non-technical user. Chain analysis does the blockchain analysis for you and gives you a pretty interface. Whereas our concept is we're uh, a, a programming tool that you can use as a programmer uh, to do a whole bunch of pretty sophisticated stuff, most of which you can't do through a pure point and click interface. So that's BlockSci, and I'm going to show you the principles behind BlockSci and how you can use it today. By the way, you might wonder, you know, if blockchain analysis is, uh, can, can yield so many interesting insights, why aren't more people doing it? There are a few reasons. One is that parsing the data is just painful. When you have the data that's stored on disk from Bitcoin Core or whatever wallet client, it's not optimized in a form that's useful for analysis. It's optimized for a different purpose. So you don't want to be writing the code to directly interface with that data and to parse it. And most previous tools we've found have poor performance and they have a cumbersome programming interface. And with BlockSci, we set out to solve these problems for you and make it as easy as possible, as fast as possible, as expressive as possible. OK. Now, the first question that you might have in your mind is, how do you get good performance? Blockchain data is big data. So how do we scale blockchain analysis? The Bitcoin blockchain alone is over 160 gigabytes and growing quickly. We support a number of different blockchains. So how do you do this at scale? There is kind of a received wisdom, I would say, in the technology industry. The traditional way to solve this kind of big data problem is to use this kind of parallel processing infrastructure. For example, Hadoop MapReduce would let you do this, but also a number of similar tools. You take your data and you partition it across a number of different nodes, and you do the processing in parallel, and then you combine all of the results and you get your answer back. This is the traditional way to do things with some slight variations. So the reason that people use parallel processing for this kind of thing is because of two assumptions. One is we can't possibly do it on a single machine because the data won't fit in memory. And the other is if we do it on a single machine, the performance is going to be too slow. So it's not going to scale for these big data workloads we're talking about. So this, I've deliberately called it received wisdom. Not a lot of people have thought critically about these two assumptions. So let's think about these. For blockchain data, do we actually think it's not going to fit on a single machine? Do we actually think it's going to be too slow on a single machine? I want you to test your intuition. I'm going to give you a quiz just for you to think about. Uh, think about the following two things. Think about the amount of memory needed to process the Bitcoin blockchain as it exists today. And think about the amount of memory you can get out of a commodity EC2 instance from Amazon. Think about which of these is bigger. When I ask my students this question, usually they'll guess that EC2 is going to be bigger. They'll say maybe it's twice as big, something like that. But it turns out the latter is something like 100 to 200 times bigger than this. And I'm going to show this to you visually on the next slide. So we're used to thinking of blockchain data as big data, but it's actually tiny. So it turns out 
So let me start with this third one here. So the Bitcoin blockchain on disk today, or as of a few months ago when I did this experiment, it's uh, you know, something like 150 gigabytes. But it turns out that that's not an optimized representation. You can really optimize it for an in-memory representation with only about 25 gigabytes of memory. That's all that you need to process the Bitcoin blockchain today. And for a mere 66 cents per hour, you can get a 64 gigabyte instance uh, from Amazon. And the maximum that you can get out of an EC2 instance is as much as four terabytes. So not only is vertical scaling sufficient today, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be sufficient. Because the rate at which Amazon increases the memory of their largest available instance and drops their prices is growing faster than, than uh, cryptocurrency blockchains are growing. So this is our philosophy. We want to see how much performance can we get out of a single machine. And we have a reason to think, actually, that that's going to be a lot faster than a distributed approach. Because if you can hold it in memory on a single machine, you're avoiding all of the inefficiency of passing data back and forth between these different distributed processing nodes. So we tried to do that. I'm going to show you numerically what our performance is, and the numbers might be surprising. OK, here's what we found. Let me show you quickly uh, how BlockSci is architected and what it can do for you. What BlockSci does, it, it takes the raw blockchain data from a variety of different blockchains, and it parses it for you so that you don't have to do all of that cumbersome work, and it stores it in an in-memory blockchain database. So that's the key. It's an in-memory database. And I'm going to explain why uh, uh, that leads to huge performance benefits. On top of that, we've built a C++ library as well as a, a Python library for most of the common blockchain analysis tasks that you might want to do. And your code would sit up here. It would use our Python interface usually. And if you want really good performance, you might sometimes use our C++ interface. And you might know uh, that address clustering is a really powerful technique to use blockchain data and cluster it into different groups or different entities, uh, which has uh, really important consequences for whether it's competitive intelligence or analyzing the anonymity of cryptocurrencies. Uh, BlockSci already does that for you and exposes that in a library that you can quickly use and invoke. Uh, we support a number of different blockchains through a common interface. And the typical programming interface that you would use for blockchain is something called uh, Jupyter Notebook. Who's heard of Jupyter Notebook? Who's familiar with this? OK, a number of people, perhaps the majority of you. It's a really convenient uh, data science interface because it integrates the data with the code, with the visualization of the data. And it just makes blockchain analysis uh, relatively straightforward. OK, so I've been pr uh, promising you performance figures. Let me finally get to them. Here's, here's what uh, we've been able to accomplish with BlockSci in terms of performance. For the current Bitcoin blockchain, iterating over every single transaction header, transaction input, and transaction output, of which there are 1.5 billion of them, right, on a single four-core EC2 instance takes only one second. This turns out to be several hundred times to several thousand times faster than previous tools. When you can get this kind of performance, you can drop a whole lot of complexity that you typically have from data analysis. Somehow we've forgotten that computers are fast, right, if we know how to take advantage of that speed. So this is what you get with an in-memory representation. When you can do a complete linear search, you don't need a fancy database and a fancy index and all of that sort of thing, uh, which really makes data analysis complex. So these are our performance figures. Uh, our Python interface is definitely slower than this, but we're working on improving the performance so that you can write vectorized operations in Python that you might be familiar with NumPy and tools like that, so that they will actually be translated down to C++ and they will execute at the speed of C++. That's our next goal. That's what we're shooting for next, so that you can both have the complete expressiveness of Python as well as the performance of C++. So the reason that, that it's so fast is because it's not a real database. Uh, you might know of the acid properties of databases, atomicity, consistency, and so on. The reason the databases are so complex and, as a consequence, so slow is that they have to really make sure that when there are multiple readers and writers, they don't conflict with each other and that sort of thing. Right? But what's the coolest thing about a blockchain? It's an immutable database. The data doesn't change once it's written into the database. So you can completely dispense with all of these expensive ACID properties, and you can have a very simple in-memory database that's optimized for analytics. And we have a, a bunch of other various tricks, so I won't really go into that in the interest of time. OK, so the question that I get most frequently when I uh, explain BlockSci is people ask, 
So what is the query language that the programmer uses to analyze the data? Okay, it's an important question for any kind of database. And here's the funny thing. Here's my absolute favorite thing about BlocksHi. There is no query language. You can u write code in you know, full feature at Python. You can write code the way you're used to. You don't have to learn a new query language. You don't have to accept the limitations of SQL or something like that. So here's a piece of code in BlocksHi that iterates over every block in a certain date range, and it iterates over every transaction in that block, and it gets the fee, uh, and the goal here is to get the total transaction fee earned by each block in a certain period. So this is literally the most natural way you can think of writing this query in Python, and that works directly in BlockSci. And there's a slight caveat here. This would be a little bit slow, but there is a slight variant of this uh, that would execute very fast, but still in Python. So I hope I've convinced you that BlockSci has a nice combination of properties, speed and expressivity, and it provides a uniform access to a number of different blockchains. The same syntax would apply not only to Bitcoin, but for all of the blockchains that we support. We don't support Ethereum, for example, because it doesn't work based on the transaction graph model, but uh, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Namecoin, uh, Zcash even, uh, a variety of other blockchains are supported. Let me give you uh, just one more example of some of the cool things you can figure out using blockchain analysis. Here is a really simple question you might have about Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. How much are people using it? And one way to frame that, one metric that economists have come up with, is something called the velocity of money. The velocity of money is how often does one unit of money, on average, change possession from person to person. So we can try to measure that for Bitcoin. And uh, uh, you know, existing uh, tools will, uh, will do that for you, websites. Uh, 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 will calculate the amount of Bitcoin moved per day, but I'm calling this a naive estimate. The y-axis is uh, 10 million is the unit. And look, this is a very spiky graph, so it sounds like there's something fishy going on here. Usually you would expect the amount of money transferred per day to be a roughly constant value. So it turns out that what's going on, the reason that this is not a good estimate, the simple estimate doesn't really work, is because a lot of what we see on the blockchain is what is called self-churn, people transferring money to themselves between different wallets that they control. So because we have techniques like clustering that are built into BlockSci, it's very easy using BlockSci to eliminate self-churn, or at least more or less eliminate self-churn, and only end up with the transactions that represent actual transfers of possession from one entity to another. So if we do that, we actually end up with this orange line here, which is a much lower value, which is a much more stable value. And what that translates to is about 1.4 times per month. That's how often Bitcoins change possession. One unit changes possession from one person to another person. So this sort of measurement is giving us new scientific insights about how Bitcoins are being used. Using this graph and other analyses like these, uh, we've argued in our paper that there is much more speculation and holding of Bitcoin going on compared to the use of Bitcoin as an actual currency uh, based on blockchain analysis, which is a bit of a sobering note as a community. Community, I think we should think more about how to encourage uh, uh, a greater set of uses for cryptocurrencies than just speculation. So all of that comes out of blockchain analysis, and we have a draft paper that explains all this. If you just Google block site paper, uh, this will come up. But also, much more importantly, I want to tell you about our open source tool. It's on GitHub. It's a pretty active uh, uh, tool. A lot of people have been using it, and we're grateful for everybody who sent us pull requests and bug fixes and so on. Now, uh, just on a closing note, if you want to get started using BlockSci, the easiest way to do it is we've actually released an Amazon instance uh, that you can simply point and click and use on your own EC2 account. So you will get booted to your own EC2 account using the image that we have created, which will directly give you a Jupyter Notebook, this nice visualization and analysis interface with all of the blockchain data built into it. Uh, so you can get started very quickly with very little startup cost, and there is also an alternative of installing it yourself and doing the analysis on your local machine. 
So I hope what I've convinced you of is that you probably need blockchain analysis, whether it's for research or whether it's for thinking about your competitors or monitoring your own company and making sure you're not revealing confidential data on the blockchain. And I've told you how BlockSci is a really good tool for this. And I just want to add one more extra thing here, which is kind of a hobby horse of mine. The philosophy behind BlockSci is vertical scaling. You can do things on a single machine in memory. It's thousands of times faster than a distributed approach. And this is something especially for uh, students perhaps working on other data science projects. Distributed analytics, in my opinion, is mind-bogglingly overrated. If you're not convinced of that, come talk to me later and, and uh, we can have a chat about that. Uh, just a, a one quick final uh, sort of advertisement. Uh, the uh, rest of the BlockSci team and I are doing a tutorial and workshop at the MIT Media Lab. If you just Google BlockSci MIT Media Lab, this will come up. This is two days from today on Monday. So I hope to see some of you there. But I hope that some of you will start using our tool and that it'll help you with some of your blockchain related questions that you might have. All right, thank you for listening. Time for questions? Or? No. Okay.